the ushers are going to pass out uh, notes and a little quiz. There will be a prize, a cash prize for the winner of the quiz. We'll kind of do it together. It's not a very spiritual quiz. Um, today is the, was for Advent, it is the joy day, the joy candle. And uh, I, when I was on staff at a church, I had a we had a new staff member who did, we didn't have office space for, and I said, well, put him in with my office. I like people. I hate being alone. And um, so we shared office together, and he was the kind of guy that started playing Christmas music the day after Halloween. <laughs> so, um, and, and I think we were together in the office a couple years. So anyway, he would always play Christmas music early November. And every year I call him saying, hey, Keith, are you playing Christmas music yet? And this year he waited till around November 7th to start his Christmas music. He goes, you don't want to start too early, Eric. It'll get old too quick. And so anyway, um, I'm usually, as I travel, I will do podcasts and different things. But around November, I'm like, I just want to wind my year down. I'm not studying a lot. Um, and I'll just start listening to Christmas music. So I listen to Sirius XM and, and Apple Music. And so I developed this little quiz. We'll kind of go through it together. Do not use Google. Don't cheat. Just answer best you can. And um, I didn't do Christmas carols because uh, most of you know all those. So these are some modern and some old uh, Christmas songs. And once everybody has, we'll do them together. And there will be, you can go ahead and start. Just don't cheat. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of go through them together once everybody has, has the quiz. And then the notes will be on the other side. Does everybody have one? If you don't, everybody got one? And you can answer them as we go. The first one everybody should get, I will have a blank Christmas without you, cheaper, happier, quieter, or blue? Blue. Blue is the correct answer. Second one's a little harder. I have a blank, blank, blank in my heart. A little baby Jesus, a old Christmas carol, a Christmas tree farm, or a quiet family dinner. What, what is it? It is, I have a Christmas tree farm in my heart, <laughs> according to Taylor Swift. <laughs> Imagine getting to heaven. Do you have Jesus in your heart? No, I've got a Christmas tree farm. <laughs> Number three, the song White Christmas was written for the 1942 movie, Home for Christmas, White Christmas, Holiday Inn, or Christmas with Bing Crosby. It is C, Holiday Inn is the name of the movie. I think uh, Mike and Terry went to that for their first date in 1942. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing. The blank is on the table and pudding made from figs. Turkey, ham, goose, or roast? Goose, extra credit. What song is it from? Grandma got run over by a reindeer. <laughs> the boogie woogie Santa lives like a blank in a cave. Bear, elf, hermit, or old man? It's hermit. If you got C, it's correct. The boogie woogie Santa lives like a hermit in a cave, and he actually doesn't bring presents. I didn't realize it until I looked at the lyrics. The Grinch has the tender sweetness of a seasick elephant, hippo, crocodile, or buzzard? The correct answer is C, crocodile. Eartha Kitt asked Santa Baby for the deed to a gold mine, silver mine, copper mine, or platinum mine. It is, the correct answer is D, platinum mine. Nat King Cold offered a simple phrase to kids from 1 to 62, 72, 82, or 92. 92 is the correct answer. D, 92. According to Kelly Clarkson, Christmas isn't canceled, just A, U, B, New Year's, C, student loan debt, or D, joy. 
The correct answer is A, you. Christmas isn't canceled, you are. <laughs> That's what you don't want to hear from your wife on Christmas Eve. Gayla Peavy wanted a hippopotamus for Christmas. No dinky blank would do. Toy, tinker toy, stocking, or present? B, tinker toy is the correct answer. And the last question is, Old Lang Syne is a Scottish phrase translated literally. Hey, wow. wow, UVA lost another football game. <laughs> B, old long sense. C, why are we wearing skirts? Or D, Braveheart. <laughs> the correct answer is B. Everybody should have got that. Did anybody get all 11? Who are all 11 people? Stand up. Nobody, did anybody get 10? Stand up. Nine? Anybody get nine? Y'all don't listen to much Christmas music. Eight. Do we have any eights? Anybody get eight of them right? You got two with eight. Stand up. If you got eight, stand up because you got to go to the tiebreaker. Tiebreaker. What is the total number of partridges and drummers received during the 12 days of Christmas? The closest one wins. <laughs> and you can just guess the number. Thirteen. Oh. All right. The, no, but the partridges. They got a partridge every day. The correct answer is twenty-four. But you're both winners. So here's. $10 in Walmart gift cards. <laughs> so, so. You'll re-gift it. Okay, there you go. So just so you know, the, the, the person received a partridge every day of the 12 days of Christmas, but he only got uh, drummers drumming one day, so 12 and 12 is 24. So hopefully you had a little fun with that. Um, learned a, lo a little something. I don't know what Rick will think of that. But uh, <laughs> we will get into Scripture. That's <laughs> what happens when you let an old youth pastor do your Sunday service. <laughs> now we're going to watch videos and eat popcorn. <laughs> no. Let's go ahead and turn it over to John, or no, Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2. Charity has already read um, this scripture to us. We're going to look at joy this morning, um, as it is on, on our Advent calendar, joy. So we'll start Luke chapter 2, verse 8. It says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. And found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the comfort it brings. We thank you for the joy it brings. Father, we pray for each individual here today, no matter what they're going through, um, whether it's good or bad, whether life has met their expectations or disappointed them. 
that there, our hope collectively would be in you and that our joy would be stirred up this morning as we study your word in Jesus name. Amen. As we look, the, the shepherds had an angelic visitation. And um, I had the, Janet and I had the pleasure of going to Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1988. And Tulsa was the epicenter of Christian and spiritual weirdness. <laughs> um, if there was a weird person in the United States, uh, they would end up in Tulsa going to one of several Bible schools, one of which is the one we went to. And, um, and you would have all kind of people saying they'd had all kind of experiences. So if somebody came up to you and said, hey, an, an angel visited me, depending on the nature of that person would be how you would judge this experience. And so in this case, this was a angelic visitation to a group of people who we would consider probably pretty normal. They were just shepherds out in the field doing their job. They, as by accounts, we don't see where they were scholars. You know, the wise men would come later who were scholarly, who were looking for the Messiah. These guys were just out doing their job. And they had this angelic visitation. And I thought about it like in my house, in our neighborhood, you know, in every neighborhood, you've got quote unquote normal people, and then you got quote unquote weird people. <laughs> and, um, if you don't know who the w weird person is, it may be you. Um, but, but um, you know, I got some neighbors that if they came up, or I, one neighbor in particular, if he came up and said he had an angelic visitation, I would be like, yeah, um, I don't know about this. But I've got these other guys I know, they're the only people I know that will be out late at night. Um, they coon hunt in our area. They, you know, uh, run their dogs and they go coon hunting. And if they came up and they said, Eric, then we were out and we, these angels appeared to us and they told us such and such, I would be like, wow, this, this could be real because they they're not those type guys. <laughs> they're not the guys to conjure up something. They would, I would be like, whoa, tell me a little more. And that's what we see with these shepherds, normal, ordinary people just doing their job. They have this angelic visitation and God, um, or angels appear to them. And it says, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So they, and, and you'll find the baby wrapped in swallowing clothes. And so after the visitation, the shepherd said, let's go and see this thing that has happened that the Lord made known to us. Now the interesting thing is they don't have an address. All they know is there's this baby that has been born. They're going to find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes line. That's all they know. So what we gather is they had to go find Mary and Joseph and Jesus. I looked up um, the population of Bethlehem. Some scholars believe it was around 500. Some scholars say it was 1,500 to 2,000. With the, the tax census and why they were there, it's, Obviously, it was, if it was a city of, or a little town of 500, it was a crowded town of 500 because there was no, you know, Mary and Joseph are in a stable. So they've got to go and look for the Messiah. So uh, I don't know what they did, if they went door to door, if they asked, hey, has anybody heard about a baby being born? You know, in a little town, even if it's a couple thousand, if there's a baby being born, um, word would get around. But what we see here is that they went, they eventually find Mary and Joseph, and they made known what the angels had told them concerning the child. And it says, all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. So whether this was the door knocking crowd where they were looking for him, or if they had gathered up a little following, like, hey, you know, if somebody came to my house and said, an angel sits, you know, the Savior had been born, I might have a tendency to go with them. Like, I want to see this. This is, this is something special. Um, doesn't happen every day. But it said, all who heard it wondered. They wondered. So, like, what does this mean? What is this about? 
But then it says, but Mary, it makes a distinction, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. So Mary treasured and pondered. The multitude wondered. But what was the message? The message was this. I bring you good news of great joy for all the people that unto you is born this day a Savior. It was a message of joy, not just of joy like Christmas joy. It was a message of joy that a Savior had been born, that the Messiah had come. What is joy? A lot of people confuse what is joy and happiness. The basic definition of joy is joy indicates that something's worth celebrating. Life's worth celebrating. The Messiah is worth celebrating. Happiness is my expectations match my reality. So when, when we have expectations and they match reality, we're happy. When we have expectations and they don't match our reality, we're typically unhappy. There's a, um, a video going around, kind of a viral video, of a mother who gave her daughter, a 17 or 18 year old, a brand new car. Gave her a brand new $70,000 Tesla. The daughter is irate, unhappy. She wanted a Mercedes. <laughs> But her expectations, mama's going to give me a Mercedes, were not matched by the reality. She goes, I hate Teslas. I hate Teslas. I was like, give me that lady's number. I'll call her up. I love Teslas. <laughs> Test-driven one. There's nothing like it. Um, but when expectations don't match my reality, I'm unhappy. And we can be critical of the girl, but we've all had times where, you know, what I want and what I got that match, I am unhappy. But joy supersedes that. Joy is, this is worth celebrating. This is worth celebrating whether I'm happy. This is worth celebrating whether I'm unhappy. This is worth celebrating whether life is good or whether life is hard. We are going to celebrate this. Um, let's look over at... Um, In Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And I already went. The three responses to the shepherd's message were wonder, treasure, and ponder. The crowd wondered, Mary treasured, and Mary pondered. We're going to look at what Jesus had to say about joy and about celebration. And in this passage, Jesus had sent out I believe it's the 72. Yep, he had sent out the 72, and they had gone out and preached. And it says in verse 17, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. There is a connection between joy, celebration, and knowing that your name is written in heaven, written in the book of life. What he is saying to them is, is hey guys, th this is a great day. Yeah, the demons were subject to you. Yes, you have authority, all this authority. But your rejoicing, your celebration is not in that. It's that your name is written in heaven. Why would that be important? Out of the, this is talking about the 72, but out of the 11 surviving apostles, if we take Judas out of the picture um, was it nine or ten would be martyred every day wasn't going to be a good day you know they weren't going to come back from every missionary journey what we would call victorious 
said, let your joy, let your celebration be on that which is, in, which is eternal. Let your joy be grounded in something eternal. Let's look over at Philippians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. We'll start in verse 2 and read down to verse 4. It says, I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. You see the connection again. Paul saying, he, he's mentioning all these people, and he says, the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let him be your celebration. Uh, you know, if we're going to celebrate who do we celebrate? Christ our Savior. What do we celebrate? That our name is in the book of life. Uh, see, and we'll get into it in a second. And this is especially pertinent to us today. How do we cultivate more joy? One, we ask the question, is my name in the book of life? If the answer is yes, then it's simple. We think about it more. We celebrate it more. Um, you know, as during the prayer list, if you look on your prayer list, there's Willie Green. He's going through terminal cancer. And yet, Rick goes, it's the same Pastor Willie, full of joy. Why? Well, he celebrates his salvation. He's been through illness before. He's been through sickness before. Um, he's celebrating his salvation. But is your name in the book of life? If yes, then we need to think about it more, celebrate it more. If the answer is no, then the answer is in Acts 2, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's pretty simple there. If it's I don't know, you know, somebody said, I don't know if my name's in the book of life or not. Well, you need to make certain, you know, again, the answer is in Acts 2, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus. The second thing, on, you know, for believers is to realize it's possible to have joy and celebrate whether I am happy or unhappy. Um, I volunteer with hospice, and as I visit people, all different state, you know, if you're on hospice, things typically aren't going well. But you're encountering, especially this time of year, people who are you know on hospice their relatives on hospice and i never realized like the amount of care like if your relatives on hospice and you're taking care of them at home it's a 24 hour day seven day a week job and yet you you encounter people who have are not happy you know they're facing the last christmas with their relative but yet they have a joy they have hope. They have peace. Um, and it is possible to have joy and celebrate at the same time you're either happy or unhappy. If life's going well and you're super happy, don't feel guilty about it. Enjoy it. Um, if life's not going especially well, you can still celebrate and have this deep abiding joy in the midst of being terribly unhappy and going through pain at the same time. Third, third is something I feel like is very important for us in our day is disconnect your joy and happiness from social media. Um, so it's a proven fact, the more time you spend on social media, like people when they study folks, if your social media time's up, your happiness is usually down. And it's, there's multiple reasons for that. 
Um, I'll talk a little bit. Like a few weeks ago, I came to church, and uh, Janet wasn't feeling well, so I came by myself. And it was the day they announced the college football playoffs. And so I, I, I go to church, and we're talking about the playoffs, and I get in my car, and I'm like, the, they announced who's made the playoffs. And, um, you know, they announced the teams, and I had a, a – so I'm listening to ESPN all the way home. I get home. I'm looking on my computer – or on my um, phone, watching YouTube videos about the selection show and the controversy. Finally, about 2 o'clock, you know, and, I, and the more I'm looking at it, the madder I'm getting. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, about 2 o'clock, I realize, okay, it's 2 o'clock. I, I'm a runner. I enjoy running. I want to go for a run. I want to enjoy the, you know, I work all the time. I want to enjoy the time I have with my wife. I go see dad Sunday nights. I want to enjoy my time with dad. Like, I had to go through this mental checklist of, one, I'm not a Florida State fan or Alabama fan or a Michigan fan <laughs> or whoever else is. I don't know. Washington. I don't even know the other team. Who is it, J.D.? Texas. Texas. Definitely not a Texas fan. Um, yeah, I, I'm not a fan of any of these teams at all. I don't know any players on these teams. I don't know any coaches on these teams. Um, wh no matter which of these teams win or lose, it's not going to affect my life at all. Like, and I had to go through this mental checklist. ESPN really doesn't care who's in the playoffs. All they want is for me to keep watching and clicking. They want a controversy. You know, they, you know, I'm just eyeballs watching advertisements to them. They're selling me advertise, And I'm like, this thing is, is ruining my emotion and my day, and I have no vested interest in it. I'm a pawn <laughs> in their game of media. And so I'm like, okay, turn it off. Re kind of. Okay, this is how the rest of my day is. It's kind of like taking control of your life. Um, you know, I, was, my, I have these, my cousin's children worked at this restaurant, and they said there was this family there. And um, it was like teenagers, college kids, and parents. And they are cussing and fighting and fussing and using the foulest language. And my cousin's child went up to the table to take the order. They hand her their phones and say, here, take a picture of us. They immediately, everybody looks happy for this picture <laughs> for Instagram. She takes the picture, takes their order, and they go back to fighting like they were before. And so if you saw that family, you would think, wow, they're the perfect family. They're not like my family. My family's crazy. You know, we fight and fuss and all this, and, but their family gets along all the time. What you see on social media is not reality. Um, you know, you have to, like, if you can distance yourself on social media, everybody looks like they're on vacation, they're always happy, or they're always complaining, depending on who they are. But, um, yeah, you got to... You got to disconnect uh, from that. Um, lastly, like Mary, treasure and ponder the message. You know, what is the message? The message in the book of Luke is that we have a Savior who has been born. Um, the other week, I was doing my devotions, I wasn't really preparing for this, I was just doing my normal devotions, and I, and I just had this thought, like, what if Jesus had never been born? What if I didn't have a Savior? What would my life look like? Or what if I didn't accept Christ? Or what if I didn't meet Rick in college who led me back to Christ? You know, how would my life look different? Um, you know, like Mary, treasure and ponder the message. You know, for those who are believers, go back and treasure and ponder coming to know Christ as your Savior. Um, and one of the things I highly treasure is my baptism. Like, I was baptized at nine. I meant it. I understood what I was doing. I, did, I haven't always walked with God since then. I've had ups and downs. But as a nine-year-old, I... As, I was committing my life publicly to Christ, 
And you go back and you treasure and ponder those things. You have a Savior who loves you. And what does that do? Whether life is, like I said, life's good, life's bad, whatever. It, it grounds you in this is worth celebrating. You know, I, I love when the, we have, you know, baptism services. And we celebrate and we clap. And we don't have to wait, you know, you don't have to be rebaptized and all that. Celebrate what God has already done in your life. As we close today, I just want to encourage you. Uh, probably said it over and over. Your joy is, is wrapped around that which is worth celebrating. Jesus, your Messiah, is worth celebrating. Your happiness is tied to what you expect and what you get. And if those don't match up and you want to be happy, there's, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, sometimes we just got to be comfortable being uncomfortable and unhappy. Life just doesn't work out like we always want. There's certain things we can't undo. We've got to, you know, go, as we say, go through them. Uh, but today as we leave, I want, you know, over, when I was a youth pastor, we, we brought in a lot of really rough kids. We had a, they weren't rough kids, they were wonderful kids, but from rough backgrounds. And, um, and, and the children came from quite stressful environments. So we did the normal Christmas party and youth Christmas party and stuff. But due to the nature and the number of challenges that they were facing, we would always, I would always do a message on surviving Christmas. <laughs> Thriving and surviving during Christmas because during Christmas, domestic violence goes up. You know, um, alcoholic families um, tend to have a lot of stress. A lot going on and we would, we would talk about, you know, the focus is not on Christmas. We understand Christmas meaning this magical holiday because sometimes life isn't very magical even during the holiday and we, and we would talk to the kids like some of you are going to face some severe challenges over over these next few weeks you know you're going to be home with alcoholic parents who are abusive how do you navigate that and we would you know as best we could try to help them um, but we would also encourage them there's a huge difference between what you're experiencing and what Christ is doing in your heart. Because <laughs> he's doing something special in your heart so your kids don't have to go through that. He's doing something special in your life so that no matter if life's up or down, your life can be different. Um, and that no matter how life turns out, that you will spend eternity with him. And so this morning, as we close, I just want to encourage you. Um, Christmas is wonderful, the trees, the music, the, the stupid songs. <laughs> but I'm so thankful we have more than just a Christmas tree farm in our heart. <laughs> I'm thankful we have a, a living God who loves us and is close to us in our heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for this day. Lord, we thank you that for us as believers, this is more than a season of trees and lights and gifts. This is the message of our Savior uh, who came to earth. And Lord, whether we have money or no money, uh, whether our family's a mess or, or not, Lord, we can celebrate you and what you've done for us. Lord, for those that are here today that don't know you or need to recommit, I pray that you would uh, turn their hearts back to you. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.